Welcome to the Malcolm Renfrew Interdisciplinary Colloquium for Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. My name is Kenton Bird. I'm the co-coordinator of this series along with my colleague, Dan Buckbitch from the Lionel Hampton School of Music. And uh, we're delighted to have a, a guest uh, joining us uh, remotely, uh, but with a very strong Idaho connection. And I'll introduce him in just a moment. Uh, I wanted to give a preview of what to uh, expect uh, next week as we move forward in uh, this series. Tuesday, April 20th, we have a panel discussion with three faculty members lined up from the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences, uh, Ashley Kerr, Tara McDonald, and Rebecca Schofield will be speaking about popular culture, affect, and animals. And I uh, hope you can join us for uh, that uh, truly interdisciplinary presentation with a historian, a literature specialist, and a modern language teacher. Uh, this week is the deadline for the priority proposals for the colloquium uh, for fall semester. And uh, we are especially interested in hearing from uh, people who may have presented during the very first year of the colloquium, 2001-2002. Uh, and I'm seeing Ray Dacey's name on the screen. And if memory serves me correctly, Professor Dacey was uh, among those early presenters. Uh, and we're hoping to do a little bit of uh, flashback of uh, 20 years of interdisciplinary scholarship, creative activity and teaching here at the University of Idaho. So uh, please uh, email me if you have a proposal or if you'd like to nominate someone for speaking uh, next uh, time around. Today's speaker uh, as a topic, uh, as they say on Law and Order, rip from the headlines. Uh, the Tuesday night massacre of 1980 and four Senate elections and the radicalization of the Republican Party uh, with special attention uh, to the 1980 Senate election in Idaho that uh, pitted uh, incumbent Frank Church against uh, Republican challenger Steve Sims. Our speaker today, Mark Johnson, has worked as a broadcast journalist and a consultant in communication and crisis management. He was a top aide to Idaho's longest serving governor, Cecil Andrus. His writing on politics and history has been published in the New York Times, California Journal of Politics and Policy, and Montana, the magazine of Western history. Uh, he writes a regular column each Friday for the Lewiston Morning Tribune and has a blog called Many Things Considered. So here to take us back uh, 40 some years uh, into a, a important turning point in Idaho's uh, political history, please welcome Mark Johnson. Thank you so much, Kenton. And hi, everyone. Really pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I feel like I'm almost back on the campus. It's been a while, but uh, great to be part of uh, having an opportunity to, to uh, spend a few minutes with you all today. I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the background of this book first and uh, why I was drawn to the story. Um, a little bit about the uh, research that I undertook uh, to put the book together and then I'll spend the bulk of the time on uh, my, my takeaways, my conclusions from the research uh, into the late 1970s and 1980 campaigns that were influenced by an outfit called the National uh, Conservative Political Action Committee. Of course, in Idaho, the focus uh, in 1980 was, as Kenton said, on Senator Frank Church and his reelection. He was seeking a fifth term in 1980. Church had just come off, among other things, the investigation of the Central Intelligence Agency and other intelligence agencies in the 1970s and had been the floor sponsor of a very controversial uh, issue, the Panama Canal Treaties in 1978. So 
That's part of the run up to his uh, reelection effort in 1980. A shameless promotion here uh, about the book. I'll, I'll just say that I think the import to me of the 1980 election uh, hinges on, a, on about a, three or four different things that I think kind of came together in 1980 uh, to make some profound changes in American politics. Um, I think of 1980 as a hinge point really in the, the development particularly of modern American politics and the evolution of the Republican Party over the last 40 years. Uh, the campaign, I think, has affected the trajectory of the GOP uh, for that 40-year period. It had real impacts as well on the United States Senate, including, I believe, uh, the nationalization of every subsequent Senate race. Uh, Senate races after 1980 were not uh, primarily or even at all really concerned with uh, parochial state-level issues they all became uh, national contests focused on, frankly, who was going to, what, which party was going to control the United States Senate. So remember 1980 from the standpoint of the Carter-Reagan election, uh, incumbent President Jimmy Carter um, defeated in a landslide by Ronald Reagan, ushering in uh, the Reagan, re so-called Reagan revolution and um, really the uh, upward trajectory, I would say, of the conservative right in America for at least the next 20 years or so. 1980 also marked, I believe, um, not the first time that research was used in campaigns by any means, but the way it was used on a sophisticated uh, national basis, very sophisticated research, and I'll get into that in just a, in just a moment. Also saw uh, really the perfection of the direct mail fundraising campaign, uh, which was uh, very instrumental in Church's uh, campaign in 1980, as well as the other campaigns that I focus on in the book. The direct mail had an impact uh, because not only was it a way to uh, solicit and receive uh, small donations from literally hundreds of thousands of people across the country, but it was a terrific way to deliver a very targeted message uh, to voters. Also saw the widespread use, national use for the first time of independent expenditure campaigns. These campaigns, as you probably know, are absolutely ubiquitous in our politics now. It's impossible to think of a Senate race where outside groups don't spend literally millions of dollars to influence the outcome. But in 1980, this was a relatively new phenomenon, and it's certainly not been used on a coordinated basis as it was in 1980. You also saw in 1980 the sort of the coalition, uh, coalesce, coalescing of evangelical Christians uh, behind Republican candidates uh, across the country. Um, in 1976, Jimmy Carter, that uh, born again Southern Baptist Sunday school teaching uh, evangelical, uh, was broadly supported by evangelical Christians in his run for the White House. By 1980, that had completely flipped and evangelical Christians, thanks in no small part to the work of the moral majority, Jerry Falwell's group, uh, broadly embraced Reagan and uh, Republicans on the new right. So this is really the, the kind of the coming to fruition, I guess, of the new right that began to form in my judgment, in the early 1970s, with a host of groups coming together and really exercising their clout uh, in 1980. Said I'd say a word about the, uh, the research that I undertook for this book. <clears throat> there are marvelous uh, archival collections for a number of the senators that I uh, profile in the book, including Frank Church at Boise State. The library there has his uh, papers very well organized. Uh, Indiana University in uh, Bloomington, Indiana is the repository of Senator Birch Bayh's papers, uh, a really, really complete collection of Bayh's uh, materials related to his three terms in the Senate. Same can be said for the University of Iowa Library in Iowa City, which is the repository of uh, both uh, John Culver and Dick Clark's papers, uh, two Iowa senators in this period. 
And Princeton University is uh, the repository for the major collection of George McGovern papers. So I consulted all of those collections, traveled to all those libraries, uh, traveled to the Carter Library in Atlanta uh, to look at material in the Carter Library collection, particularly including the papers of uh, a New York Times reporter, Adam Clymer, who wrote uh, a book about the Panama Canal treaties uh, in <clears throat> several years ago. And he did a lot of research into the new right and in particularly into their uh, fundraising. I also consulted material at uh, the Reagan Library. Interestingly, uh, papers that are not available to scholars, to researchers, are the Dan Quayle papers, uh, which are privately held. Uh, none of Quayle's material related to his Senate tenure or his time as vice president uh, are open to researchers. Uh, Chuck Grassley is one of the other per, uh, central characters in my book, current Senator from Iowa. His papers understandably are not available to researchers since he's still in office. Um, and there are some, connect, some uh, pretty good co collections of materials related to Steve Sims, the College of Idaho and Caldwell and to uh, Senator Jim Abner, who defeated McGovern in 1980, whose papers are at the South Dakota Historical Society. For the purposes of uh, my comments today, the, the major takeaway from 1980, beyond the fact that Reagan wins the White House, is that Republicans capture the Senate for the first time uh, in a quarter century. Not since uh, Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower's presidency had Republicans had majority control in the Senate. In total, 12 Senate seats flip in 1980, including uh, the four that I focus on that were the targeted races uh, impacted by Nick Pack's activities. So it's a wholesale change in American politics um, and a particularly profound change in the Senate. So you see uh, Church, for example, losing uh, the chairmanship of the Foreign Relations Committee uh, and being replaced by Jesse Helms from North Carolina. You see uh, McGovern losing uh, in 1980, uh, being replaced by uh, a, a darling of the new right, a guy by the name of Jim Abner, who's mostly forgotten to history now. A church, of course, replaced by Sims. Um, Culver, who was a uh, major uh, liberal voice in the Senate on uh, security policy, armed forces issues, as a member of the Armed Services Committee in the Senate, uh, loses and re is replaced by a very much more conservative senator in um, Chuck Grassley. Uh, Quayle replaces uh, Birch Bayh in Indiana. Bayh had been a, a very important member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, single-handedly uh, given the responsibility for passing two amendments to the Constitution. It's been said that Birch Bay wrote more of the Constitution than any person other than the founding generation, a member of the founding generation. He's also the uh, author of Title IX, which has become so important to women in higher education. And we think of it in, in terms of athletic opportunities for women in higher education, but it was, of course, broader than that. And Birch Bay was the architect of that. So you had these sort of liberal lions of the Senate replaced by a whole different generation of new right activists, if you will. People who saw the Senate in a very different light, I believe, than the people that they replaced. So I'll talk a little bit about Frank Church and I have to give a shout out to Leroy Ashby and Rod Grammer's a great book about uh, the biography of Senator Church. Church, I think, uh, was number one, a legislator, uh, a guy who went to the United States Senate uh, at the ripe old age of 32 in 1956, determined uh, to be a player, to be somebody who was uh, deeply involved in legislation, uh, secured an early appointment to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, became a recognized expert on American foreign policy, I think a true intellect, uh, a, a true student of American politics and history. And um, I think of Frank Church as being uh, an independent sort of uh, United States Senator in the best tradition of 
that kind of independence, somebody who was willing to challenge the conventional wisdom in his own party, uh, often as he did during uh, the period of Vietnam and the, and the Johnson presidency. I'm currently researching a, a book um, that I hope will be a book on the 1960s, uh, the Senate in the 1960s. And I came across the other day, the uh, news coverage of Church's uh, speech in February of 1965. Uh, Senate speech in February of 1965, Leroy might remember this, where he spoke for the first time really on the Senate floor with his um, profound and I think very eloquent and very prescient concerns about American policy in Southeast Asia, particularly in Vietnam. So he's standing up to the president of the United States of his own party, uh, sometimes, oftentimes at great uh, personal political risk uh, to his generally very conservative Idaho constituency. So a major player in the Senate, obviously for uh, the 1960s and 70s. And by 1980, as I mentioned, he's chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee with a historic investigation of the intelligence agencies uh, just in his rear view mirror. By the way, I'll say just a word on the intelligence uh, investigations. Um, in my judgment, and I'm would defer to Leroy on this, but I really think it could, could be said that the church committee investigation of the intelligence agencies was the most consequential uh, congressional investigation in our history with maybe the exception of Watergate. Um, we would not today as American citizens know one tenth of what we know about the scope of American involvement around the world through its intelligence agencies without the investigation that Senator Church led in the, the late 1970s. Profoundly important investigation that uh, in many ways seems even more important today to me than it was when he conducted it in the 70s. Church is uh, a target. Beginning in 1979, a group called the National Conservative Political Action Committee starts coming after him uh, in a very coordinated, very specific way. The picture is of Terry Dolan, who became the executive director of NICPAC, a young conservative activist from uh, the Northeastern states, had been involved in the Young Republican Movement as a, as a young guy, worked at, uh, in and around the edges of various political campaigns. And in 1975, uh, Dolan, along with uh, two of his colleagues, two other young uh, Republican activists, form the National Conservative Political Action Committee, NICPAC. They want to, in my judgment, uh, number one, take over the messaging of the Republican Party. And then they really want to take over the Republican Party. And for the most part, I argue in the book, they have succeeded in doing that. Dolan would not live to see the full extent of his influence on the Republican Party, but I think it was profound. By the way, his other two colleagues in the startup of NICPAC uh, were a guy named Roger Stone, you probably recognize that name. Roger Stone, uh, self-described dirty trickster, uh, Nixon aficionado, Donald Trump consigliere, was one of the original founders of NICPAC, as was Charles Black, uh, still a prominent Washington, D.C. lobbyist who worked in uh, pretty much every subsequent Republican administration after Reagan. So these three guys formed this political action committee in 1975. They had great encouragement from Jesse Helms, the very conservative Republican senator from North Carolina. In fact, uh, Terry Dolan credits Helms with being the godfather of NICPAC. He came up with the concept of an independent political action committee operating separate from the Republican Party that would attempt to influence the direction of the Republican Party. Helms gave uh, Nick Pack credibility with others on the conservative right. He also brought to the, uh, to the table for Nick Pack, Richard Vigory, sometimes called the funding father of the new right. Vigory, beginning with Barry Goldwater's campaign in 1964, uh, came to perfect the art of direct mail fundraising. And it's important to note about Vigory that he realized early on that 
not only could he raise money off of direct mail, but he could deliver uh, a very uh, precise message with the mail. So the message was as important to Vigory as the money. Uh, and this is a quote from an interview he gave several years ago to Terry Gross on NPR's uh, Fresh Air, where he said, we just have to admit it, uh, in our politics, people are motivated by anger and fear much more than by positive emotions. The other person that uh, Jesse Helms brought to Nick Pack was uh, a pollster, a public opinion researcher named Arthur Finkelstein. He'd worked on all of Helms's campaigns in North Carolina. Uh, and by, 19, by the late 1970s uh, was really uh, the new rights uh, leading conservative pollster. Finkelstein had a notion that um, elections were becoming less and less about party identification and more about ideology. Uh, one of his uh, <laughs> person who's analyzed his work said that he was a master at looking at a poll, looking at the numbers and finding emotion within those numbers. And he was particularly good at stoking emotions around uh, grievance, fear, uh, anger in the electorate, uh, making people act on uh, their emotions. And he was also particularly adept at targeting what uh, he called and Dolan called low information voters, voters who were perhaps not regularly involved in politics, who maybe were only sporadic voters, not regular voters, but who, if uh, cultivated and the right messages were delivered to them could be made to act on those messages. And that was at the heart of their strategy in these 1980 campaigns. The other thing that allowed NICPAC to be successful, uh, as successful as it became in 1980, was a Supreme Court case, the foundational case in all subsequent uh, campaign finance uh, law, the Buckley case of 1976. In essence, the case was important to Nick Pack because the court ruled, the court held that an independent expenditure committee could raise and spend unlimited amounts of money as long as there was no coordination between the independent committee and a campaign, uh, a candidate, no coordination between an independent expenditure campaign and a candidate. So Nick Pack really had an open field to raise and spend unlimited amounts of money. And beginning in 1976, they started really to raise lots and lots of money. So it permitted the independent groups to raise and spend this money uh, in a way that had not happened before uh, the Buckley decision. The other thing the new right needed in order to sort of weaponize these tools, the fundraising by direct mail, the message delivery by direct mail, uh, the ability to raise money thanks to the Buckley case were some emotional issues. And one of the issues that Vigory was particularly sold on using and Finkelstein, the pollster were uh, sold on using was the Panama Canal treaties which uh, <clears throat> were approved by the Senate in the late 1970s. Uh, you all know from your constitutional studies that uh, treaties must be ratified by two thirds of the members of the Senate. So it was a bipartisan approval of these agreements, which dating back to the Eisenhower administration had been ad advocated by every uh, subsequent uh, Republican and Democratic administration. Uh, the negotiations over returning sovereignty of the Panama Canal uh, to the Republic of Panama came to fruition during Carter's presidency, and the debate played out on the Senate floor in 1978, with Senator Church from Idaho being the floor sponsor of this controversial measure. And frankly, it was controversial because it was made to be controversial. Um, Ronald Reagan had seized upon the issue in his uh, short live challenge of Gerald Ford's presidential candidacy in 1976, made a series of speeches around the country saying that, um, you know, in essence, we built it, we paid for it, 
it's ours, we shouldn't be giving it away. Uh, a very simple message uh, to weaponize, if you will, a very nuanced issue that uh, involved it, uh, considerations such as general US foreign policy in Latin America, involved whether uh, literally tens of thousands of US military personnel would indefinitely be stationed in Panama in order to guard the canal, uh, whether the uh, rest of the world would see the United States as continuing sort of a colonial um, domination over a, a Central American country in actions that dated back to the Theodore Roosevelt administration. So it's a very nuanced uh, argument to, to make in favor of the canal treaties, very simple argument to say that we paid for them, uh, paid for the canal and we should keep it. Nonetheless, acrimonious debate in the Senate, uh, virtually everybody identified on the conservative Republican right at the time opposing the treaties, including Senator McClure from Idaho, Jesse Helms, of course, but more moderate Republicans like Howard Baker from Tennessee, who would subsequently become the majority leader when the Republicans took over the Senate in 1980, supported uh, the Panama Canal treaties. But it's a weaponized issue. And Vigory says after the canal treaties uh, were approved, ratified, that uh, the battle was not over. He said, we may have lost that battle, but we're gonna win the war because we're gonna continue to use this issue against the Democrats who supported it. So this sets up the election in 1980 between Senator Church Great photo, by the way, from Barry Coe's collection at uh, the Lewiston Tribune. Church campaigning with Bethine and uh, Camii, I believe that was. And uh, the a real darling of the new, new right, Congressman Steve Sims from Canyon County, who had represented the first congressional district since uh, 1972, I believe, in the Senate or in the House. And in 1978, uh, 1980, he is ready to take on uh, Frank Church for the Senate seat with the help of Nick Pack. And I believe with the uh, very open encouragement from Nick Pack and its new right allies. Headline from an Idaho newspaper in 19, early 1980, Nick Pack spending more to defeat church than any of the other incumbents that they targeted. Relatively modest sums by today's standard in terms of spending but Nick Pack spent more independently in the 1980 cycle than any other independent expenditure committee and vastly more than any committee uh, on the Democratic side or on the left side of the political spectrum. One of the secrets to Nick Pack's success was beginning very early in 1979 to begin to redefine Church's record. Uh, they did some polling as Church did one of the benefits of being able to go back now and look at the archives is you can see the polling memos and the polling information that the campaigns did. Church was very popular in 1979 in Idaho. He had uh, really quite robust approval ratings. Many uh, Idahoans considered him fundamentally to be quite conservative. He'd always done very well in Eastern Idaho with predominantly uh, Eastern Idaho conservative Mormon voters. So Nick Pack knows that in 1979, it's gonna to have to conduct a really negative, consistent campaign, essentially to bring down his approval ratings. And they started very early in that process to redefine his record. Another headline, quoting a uh, Republican operative, never before was it popular to be anti-church, now he's getting picked on by a whole wave to kick out the guys who were in. And Sims was almost secondary to the effort in the minds of conservative activists. They needed somebody to be on the ballot, but they were trying to get people to vote against Frank Church. In fact, Terry Dolan uh, very publicly said during the course of the campaign, we're gonna have people in Idaho voting against Frank Church and they won't even know why they're voting against him. Persistent negative campaign attacking him as being out of touch with his state, being too liberal for Idaho, not paying attention to the state's uh, interest, being too enamored with the East Coast elites, uh, being wrong on foreign policy, soft on national security, destroying the CIA, 
you know, a systematic effort to tear down uh, his 24 year record in the Senate. Letter to the editor in the Times News in this period, pounding out the propaganda as the letter writer says, and it very much was propaganda. One of the early uh, attack ads that Nick Pack's Idaho affiliate uh, called the Anybody But Church Committee, the ABC Committee ran against the Senator, uh, had a Idaho State Republican state legislator standing in front of a Titan missile silo in Southwestern Idaho, an abandoned Titan missile silo, delivering into the camera uh, a discourse on the fact that Frank Church was soft on national defense he was not supporting a strong national defense. And these empty missile silos behind me are uh, proof of that. Well, uh, the reality was that the Titan missile had been phased out in favor of the Minuteman missile, which Church had actually supported, but the visual was powerful and the allegation was made that Church was somehow uh, weakening national defense by his uh, votes in the Senate. Um, one of the people I interviewed for the book, Don Todd, who was an Idaho Republican operative and then became the executive director of the Anybody But Church Committee, told me that uh, he had uh, received one very important piece of political advice as a young man. He said, if you're taking on an incumbent, the first campaign ad that you run against them ought to have something just a little bit wrong about it. And the purpose for that, Don Todd said, was because you want to set off a fight. You want to uh, draw a contrast and you want to have the person who's attacked hit back at you. So uh, still all these years later, 40 years later, Don Todd it, expressed some amazement that this nobody political activist in Idaho was engaged in a running debate with the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee because he was on the attack against that chairman. Sims did uh, later in the campaign, made some considerable effort to distance himself from the efforts of Nick Pack and the Anybody But Church Committee. Um, and I don't make the allegation in the book and I would not make the allegation that there was direct uh, coordination between the two campaigns, the Nick Pack campaign and Sims's own Senate campaign but their consistency of message uh, is hard to ignore. Nick Pack was essentially setting the table uh, for Sims to be able to run a campaign based on many of the issues that they were surfacing against Senator Church. And the benefit of that for the uh, challenger is that Sims was able to say, well, that's not me. That's, uh, that's these out of state guys. I don't have anything to do with them. I'm, I'm taking the high road, but he benefits from the low road attacks against his opponent. So almost you know, word for word, the attacks are the same. Uh, this is a Steve Sims ad from an Idaho newspaper in 1980 that uh, essentially is saying, you know, Frank Church is uh, soft on national defense, which was one of the major charges that Nick Pack launched against uh, Church. The final closing ad that uh, the Anybody But Church campaign ran against the Senator, was just a 15 second TV ad. Don Todd looks directly into the camera and says, now that all the shouting is over, remember the Panama Canal. Frank Church voted to give it away. So, you know, a very, very simple message, uh, highly emotional issue. My old boss, Governor Andrus, uh, tried to joke in that 1980 campaign, I remember he said, well, I'm, he said, I'm not ter too familiar with the Panama Canal. Does that run from uh, Montpelier to Soda Springs? Where is that uh, Panama Canal? Uh, why would it be an issue uh, for Idaho voters, but it became a hugely emotional issue? Uh, not only in Idaho, but in these other states that uh, I cover in the book. So Sims wins on November 4th, 1980, the closest of the four races that I cover, the closest of the four campaigns that Nick Pack targeted. Uh, uh, Steve Sims wins by about 4,400 votes, very close election. 
John Culver's defeated in Iowa, a Nick Pack target. Birch Bay is defeated in Indiana, a Nick Pack target. George McGovern's defeated in South Dakota, a Nick Pack target. And Church, of course, is defeated in Idaho. Um, that's the Tuesday night massacre, if you will. Uh, a wholesale, and very much at the time it was perceived as a wholesale repudiation of liberal democratic politics in America. And of course, the Senate uh, flips to Republican control and profound changes are made in the Senate. So Idaho goes from chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, a committed internationalist, uh, somebody with deep grounding in foreign policy, a uh, guy who had uh, been the floor sponsor of the Wilderness Act in the 1960s, had been an outspoken critic of American involvement in Vietnam. Here he is with a young Joe Biden uh, to Steve Sims in the Senate. And I think of these guys uh, that were defeated in 1980 as being sort of the Senate traditionalists, people who went to the Senate uh, in order to accomplish things. I mean, they had an agenda, if you will, a legislative agenda. Um, and they acted uh, in, on that agenda for the most part, trying to pass legislation to address uh, significant national issues and concerns. They were replaced for the most part by activists, new right activists, who went to uh, Washington DC, uh, as my old friend Marty Trillhouse used to say about the Idaho legislature, to put a no on the, put a rock on the no button. Uh, they wanted to be opposed to things. They wanted to uh, cut government down to size, uh, to right size government, to roll back the New Deal, and uh, and to bring into uh, practice a different kind of conservatism. So the Senate after 1980, I think, is. Um, we're seeing the legacy of that in many ways with the way the US Senate uh, operates today. So I'll just use one example uh, before we open it up for questions about why I think uh, 1980 still resonates so deeply into our politics. I mentioned the fact that after 1980, literally no US Senate race in the country was anything other than a national contest with big national interests and uh, outside money independent expenditure campaigns coming into every state. Doesn't happen so much in a state which is, you know, so lopsided as Idaho has become now, but uh, in, in uh, a state where the Senate seats are contested between the two parties, uh, you see this uh, manifest uh, everywhere. Uh, the recent Georgia runoff elections, for example, in January, between uh, two Republicans and two Democratic candidates, an unusual situation where you have both Senate seats in the same state up at the same time, $430 million were spent in those races on independent expenditure campaigns for or against uh, one or the other of the candidates. So, and the whole reason for that, of course, is because uh, those races determine who's gonna control the United States Senate. John Culver, uh, the Democrat from Iowa who lost in 1980 to Chuck Grassley, was very prescient in uh, understanding what was going to happen to the Senate as a result of these nationalized elections and the animosity that goes along with them. He basically said in 1978, when he uh, was anticipating the kind of campaign that he was going to face two years later, that this was gonna be really a deadly thing for the Senate. The sense of uh, that you could accomplish things on a bipartisan basis, uh, that uh, these grudge matches over a Senate seat could somehow be left at the door of the Senate chamber and not be carried out uh, into the relationships and the party politics of the Senate uh, disappeared after 1980. And uh, proof of that is the fact that since 1980, we've had 12, 13 now with Georgia, 13 different times the Senate has flipped control since 1980. Prior to 1980, in the period from 1930 to 1980, the Senate control uh, changed hands four different times in 50 years. Um, so the instability uh, of the institution uh, is a consequence, I think, of the kind of politics that entered the American bloodstream in 1980. 
So I'll stop there, uh, Kenton, and be happy to try to respond to any questions. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, walk through history that uh, some of us uh, may have uh, lived through, but uh, uh, may be new to um, a lot of our uh, current students and uh, even some of our community members in the audience. And uh, I would like to invite the audience to uh, offer uh, questions uh, either by putting them into the chat uh, function uh, and I can ask them or if anyone is uh, so bold to uh, unmute themselves and I see a hand from Professor Graham Hubbs. So uh, Graham, please uh, uh, go ahead and kick off the Q&A. Great, thanks so much, Mark. That was <clears throat> wonderful and I learned a ton. Uh, I grew up in Kentucky and this is all new to me. So I, I really, really appreciate this. Thought it was very illuminating. My question is about um, uh, the, the broader cultural context in both um, in Idaho and maybe in South Dakota as well, but maybe in the US more generally in 1980. And so I'll frame it this way. Had Buckley and Vallejo happened in the early 70s and had uh, the various PACs had the foresight about the direct mailing campaigns in 72 or 73, could they have uh, pulled off in 76 what they pulled off in 1980 with the national climate or the climate in Idaho and South Dakota? Again, South Dakota is fascinating to me just because of the geographic proximity. Um, was there, or was there something special about 1980? I don't know. Vietnam being over, uh, the, the oil crisis. Um, if, if everything was in place with the law and the super PACs five years earlier, could they have pulled off in 1976 what they pulled off in 1980, do you think? Well, thank you for your kind comments, number one. Uh, the answer to your question, I think, is in my judgment, is no. I think the timing was, Nick PAC's timing was impeccable in terms of hitting a sweet spot here where uh, the tactics, uh, the timing, the political environment, uh, Jimmy Carter's lack of popularity generally, uh, the rise of Ronald Reagan as the sort of the iconic uh, new voice of Republican conservatism, all of those things had to be part of the mix. And I make the, uh, make the point, and I will make it again here, 1980 was a tough year to be a Democrat in the country. Um, Carter was unpopular, the Iranian hostage crisis was still going on during the campaign, didn't, didn't get, re get resolved until the day that Reagan was sworn into office. Um, you had uh, the lingering effects of uh, the OPEC oil embargo that you know, sent gas prices skyrocketing. Uh, there was a general uh, disconnect between American politics and a lot of people's fears and anxiety about in, in that period for sure. So Nick Pack, through luck and maybe uh, maybe a little timing and, uh, and maybe good fortune and maybe uh, uh, some good planning, uh, really seized on the moment, all of those things happening, coming together at the same time. You know, the, the, the one thing that I really um, did not realize until I got deeply into the research for this was how many of these new right groups uh, formed in that period after the Buckley decision. So um, you had Nick Pack, you had the American Conservative Union, you had the Moral Majority, you had Phyllis Schlafly's group, the Eagle Forum. All of those groups were forming, and, and others, the Conservative Caucus and the Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress. There were a whole bunch of those groups often with very overlapping agendas and very um, overla even overlapping uh, membership and coordination. Uh, Dolan joked, for example, that when somebody said, well, there's this, there's this vast conspiracy on the right out there to uh, take over American politics. And he said, yeah, you're right. We get together every 15, 20 minutes and talk about it. And they really did. Uh, they often met at Vigory's uh, home in the Virginia suburbs around his dining room table to plot strategy. So all of those things had to kind of come together. It was sort of the perfect storm uh, for, for Democrats in 1980, for sure. And some Democrats lost in 1980 who had nothing, who were not targeted by Nick Pack in any way. Warren Magnuson in Washington state lost, uh, I think more as a 
consequence of the fact that he was getting old and tired and uh, his age was showing. Uh, but there, you know, there's a number of factors that played into it. But uh, one of the enduring lessons is that these negative campaigns starting really early, using lots of outside money uh, and delivering a very uh, emotionally laden message can be damn effective and they still are very, very effective. Mark, uh, Bob has put a comment uh, plus question in uh, the chat and uh, I'll try and summarize it, but he's uh, looking for a little bit more uh, analysis about the cause of the current uh, um, polarized state and animosity in the Senate. And he's wondering, can we uh, trace that to the fact that uh, senators now no longer have constituents just in their own state, but they're having to appeal uh, to a national uh, audience, uh, even people uh, that aren't voting for them, but are certainly contributing money uh, to support or oppose them. So a little bit more about the current state of affairs in the Senate and what we can attribute that to. Well, I think there are a couple of things, Kenton that are, and Bob, that are important here. One is there's never been a golden age of the US Senate. I'd be the first to admit that. But there was a time when uh, the Senate operated uh, in a bipartisan fashion to accomplish big things. The Mansfield Senate of the 1960s, for example, a very tumultuous time, excuse me, in American history. Vietnam, uh, civil rights unrest, campus unrest, assassinations of a president, a United States Senator, civil rights leader. So a very tumultuous period in the 1960s, but the Dirksen Senate uh, succeeded in um, passing a civil rights legislation, passing the Voting Rights Act, uh, passing much of the New Deal, uh, or the Great Society legislation of Lyndon Johnson. So, and all of it was done on a bipartisan basis. And uh, that, so the, the, the idea that bipartisanship can work in the Senate again, is uh, really roadblocked, I think, by the intense partisan, uh, the intensity of the partisanship around these campaigns. So that's one thing. Second thing is, you're, I think you're right in your question that uh, many of these Senate campaigns do have to appeal to a national constituency. So you see a guy like uh, Steve Bullock, for example, a two-term in, in incumbent governor of Montana, running for the United States Senate last year against uh, a very conservative, very conservative Republican, Steve Daines. And Bullock has to run to the left in some respects in Montana in order to uh, sort of meet the um, national expectations, if you will, of the Democratic Party. He has to uh, you know, sort of flirt with gun control, something that Frank Church never did. Uh, he had to, you know, basically uh, embrace a lot of uh, arguably controversial democratic policy issues that were not popular in Montana, but that nonetheless had a national constituency. So I think there are two aspects to it. Um, the partisanship, the intense partisanship around campaigns and elections erodes the opportunity to actually have people work across the aisle, particularly when as Republicans discovered in the Senate that they could uh, attempt to thwart uh, Barack Obama's legislative agenda and actually benefit politically from that. And then, and then the other thing is the, the nationalization of these races. You know, Frank Church in 1980, for example, he wanted to run mainly on, uh, on state level issues, his support for senior citizens, the things that he had done to uh, address the economy in Idaho I remember uh, improvements in American Falls Dam was a, was a big issue in the late 70s and he was all over that kind of issue. So that's the kind of campaign he was hoping to run, but the campaign uh, was completely run on the basis of national issues. Mark, we have a question from Christine in the chat and wondering, are there a, a more equal number of left and right political activist groups today? I don't know if that was within the scope of your research for this book, but uh, maybe uh, uh, looking forward at, uh, from 1980 to what's happened in the last 40 years. 
Well, uh, I think as a general proposition, the conservative right stole the march on the liberal left uh, in the 70s in terms of forming uh, an infrastructure, if you will, of, around national politics. So I mentioned this group of uh, new right groups that formed in the late 70s. There was nothing really uh, anywhere equal to that coming from the liberal left in the 1970s. So um, the left has been playing catch up ever since, I think, in terms of creating the kind of uh, political infrastructure uh, to support that the, that the conservative right has been able to develop. And I mean, everything from independent expenditure groups to think tanks, to uh, training opportunities to train young activists, the left has always been uh, several steps behind the right on that. So there are a lot of groups that are working on the American left today, or a left of center, the progressive side of the political spectrum, but they always seem to be a little bit uh, day late and a dollar short uh, as compared to where those on the conservative right are. And, and I think the same would be true for talk radio, uh, that the uh, conservative Republicans got in on that uh, early and uh, the Democrats uh, never figured out a, a successful formula uh, for reaching their constituents through radio. Yeah, and I don't want it to seem like too much of a partisan comment, but the, the right has been really good at uh, manufacturing these issues around emotion and grievance, and we see it right now playing out at the state legislative level uh, all over the country where Republican legislators are you know, going after all kinds of issues, uh, including higher education, obviously, public schools. Uh, the, the message of grievance and fear and animosity uh, is easily stoked on the Republican right. And Democrats, uh, for good or, or ill, depending upon your point of view, have never been good at sort of perfecting that kind of emotional messaging. Uh, they tend to be more focused on sort of old school political and policy prescriptions for the country's ills as opposed to, you know, uh, focusing on uh, what transgender rights and cancel culture and uh, the kind of stuff you hear on Fox News all the time. Yeah, left leaning uh, talk radio is an oxymoron. It just uh, doesn't really exist. So Mark, I wanted to ask about Idaho's other uh, senator uh, at the time, uh, Jim McClure, um, who um, had served first in the House uh, when um, Church was in the Senate and then elected in 1972. So would have uh, had uh, eight years of uh, uh, being um, in, in the Senate with a, a Democrat. Um, I, I just pulled off the shelf. I don't know if you can see this. The, uh, McClure of Idaho uh, book uh, by William Smallwood, and there's a, a reference to uh, mid-October 1980, and um, uh, McClure has spent the whole day on Steve Sims' campaign bus and uh, spoke at a rally for him in Grangeville. But I, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the personal relationship uh, between uh, McClure and Church and uh, how comfortable uh, was uh, Jim McClure, who came from sort of the old school of Republican senators uh, with these uh, attacks on, on church uh, in the months leading up to the 1980 election? Well, that's a great question. I'll preface my answer by saying um, I knew, knew Jim McClure quite well. Uh, actually worked with him on a few projects uh, when he was uh, out of the Senate, long out of the Senate. Um, he had a, actually quite a good relationship with my old boss, C. Sandris. Uh, but Jim McClure was a, a hard-headed uh, partisan and a very conservative guy. And he, I think he was very comfortable with the campaign that was being run against Senator Church in 1980. In fact, I relate uh, the story in the book about that uh, appearance in Grangeville, which wound up on national television, ABC had a reporter there. And uh, the story that ABC ran, uh, Cassie Mackin was the reporter, was uh, to the effect that Church, or I should say Sims, had been mic'd up by the TV crew. He was wearing a wireless microphone and uh, was caught on the live mic as 
prompting a guy in the audience to ask McClure a question about the Central Intelligence Agency investigation that Church had headed. Um, and uh, McClure went on to basically uh, accuse Church of, in a really underhanded manner, I think, of making public the name of a CIA officer who subsequently was murdered and sort of implying that Church was responsible for that. There is absolutely no evidence that that happened, um, but it got great resonance. And Sims even would admit later that it was a great story for him because people were not talking about the fact that he was in essence planting a question uh, to be asked of his colleague, but he was uh, benefiting from the allegation that Church had uh, somehow nefariously released information about CIA officers that had wound up getting one of them killed. So uh, it was an ugly, ugly campaign in many respects. As to the church uh, McClure relationship, I would say it was minimal. They cooperated on things that were obviously, you know, very Idaho specific, uh, but for the most part canceled each other's vote. In fact, uh, Steve Sims told one of his uh, campaign colleagues uh, in 1978 that it was time to take on church because you know he and McClure were canceling each other's vote and we ought to decide if Idaho was going to have uh, another Republican senator. We've got time for one maybe two more questions if uh, anyone uh, would like to either put something up in the chat or uh, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask it directly. I guess I'll follow up on the question earlier about the the uh, um, number of, of political action committees on the two different sides. Um, when the Republicans jumped at the opportunity after Buckley v. Vallejo, uh, what were the Democrats doing instead? So one thought is that did they just think that the old party structure was going to serve them well? So as long as they kept building up the party itself, that that would be sufficient? Or and if not that, was it something else? Well, I think, uh, I think two things happened. One was uh, they were caught unaware, uh, caught unprepared for how coordinated and sophisticated uh, the new right uh, network was going to become, and they weren't prepared to respond to it very effectively. I think they, the Democrats largely relied on their old tried and true methods, uh, support from organized labor to provide both money and foot soldiers for campaigns. Um, but by even by 1980, uh, organized labor is in decline in America. And uh, the impact of organized labor that had such an impact during the Roosevelt and Truman era uh, in support of democratic politics generally had really started to uh, diminish by 1980. So uh, I think there were two things. They relied upon the old tried and true methods, which were no longer uh, very effective, were very sophisticated compared to what uh, the new right was doing. <clears throat> and uh, they also just did, did not respond very effectively. Uh, Democratic leaning uh, conservative or uh, independent expenditure groups raised a, a fraction of the amount of money in 1980 uh, that the new right groups uh, raised. So um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, they came to the fight with, uh, with a knife and Terry Dolan came with a submachine gun. Professor Ashby, I saw a hand there. Would you have a question or comment? Yeah, uh, just a comment. Mark, uh, really an impressive, uh, impressive talk. You have a, a the real wonderful command of the material. And it seems to me that, that the whole idea of 1980 being this pivot, uh, this, this hinge really holds up because there is a, a real resonance between then and now. I mean, a comment from that, that member of Net Nick Peck, I can't remember which one, uh, saying that the way that you get the public is to go after their fears, and their anger. I mean, that, that, that resonates right up the presence. That, that really has, has controlled so much of our political dialogue. And unfortunately, I think it has really dictated the way that, that politics has moved in recent years. And so I think a wonderful job in that respect. And I, I very much appreciate and applaud with what you're doing. I look forward to the book you're coming out with on the Senate in the, in the 60s. 
I hope it's as good as the work you're doing on, on, on this one. Well, that's extremely kind of you. It means, means the world to me coming from you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, you're absolutely right. I, I, you know, I've been very fortunate as a non-academic uh, to have two books published now by the University of Oklahoma Press. And all of you who've published with a university press know that it can be kind of an arduous process. Uh, but during the uh, peer review of uh, the manuscript for this book, Tuesday Night Massacre, uh, one of the reviewers, a wonderful guy, Walter Nugent from uh, Notre Dame, a retired historian now, and emeritus, uh, suggested, he said, you know, you really have written uh, a story about the radicalization of the Republican Party. Why don't you say that in the title of the book? And I was at first a little bit reluctant to do that. It seemed like maybe a little too, uh, a bridge too far in a way to describe it as a radicalization. But you really think about what's happened to Republican politics since uh, Reagan, since Gerald Ford, really. Uh, and it is hard not to say that this has become an insurgent outlier in our politics. And I, I just the other day went through a couple of days of news clips just to pull out some of the lines. You know, Ted Cruz was accusing uh, Joe Biden's uh, designated Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, the Attorney General, former Attorney General of California, as a left-wing activist palling around with Fidel Castro. Well, that's the kind of language that was used against Frank Church and George McGovern. Um, Steve Daines in uh, Montana said about uh, the Native American woman who's now the Secretary of the Interior. She's a hardline ideologue with radical views, vastly out of touch with the West. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of rhetoric uh, that has come to exemplify, I think, uh, the radicalization of the party. And it's not been a, uh, it's not been a symmetrical thing. I mean, uh, the, the, the Democratic Party flirted in two different election cycles, I would point out, with a self-proclaimed socialist at the top of their ticket. And they rejected him both times, went for a more traditional mainstream, uh, old school type of Democrat in Joe Biden. And uh, so it's, it's, not a, it's not an equal radicalization. Both parties have moved uh, toward their extremes, I think, over the last 40 years, but Republicans have moved a lot farther in my judgment. So, Mark, uh, before we wrap up, uh, is there any reason to uh, be optimistic? Uh, uh, is there any chance of uh, the Senate uh, recovering some of that uh, uh, bipartisan comity, the ability to work across the aisle for the, uh, the good of the country? Or are we just locked into this 50-50 uh, um, division and uh, the constant uh, changing of uh, control. Well, I have to say, I'm, uh, you know, as they say, I'm a pessimist, and pessimists are usually not disappointed. <laughs> so I am a bit of pessimistic about it all. I will say that the one bit of uh, glimmer of hope may be the approach that Biden is trying to bring to national politics, tamping down uh, the animosity and the rhetoric, not engaging in the daily fist fights on cable television uh, over whatever the issue of the moment is to try to ramp down the temperature. <clears throat> that uh, is an absolutely necessary step in my judgment to trying to get something more in terms with what you know we once thought of as the ability to at least once in a while come together somewhere in the middle and address a big national uh, issue. So it's gonna be a test, I think, uh, for congressional Republicans to see what they're willing to do on this big infrastructure package that uh, Biden has proposed now. Are they gonna be willing to work with a democratic administration in order to try to find something that they maybe both can uh, compromise a little bit on and come a little bit together on? But I think uh, the new attitude, the new approach that uh, Biden has brought, which is not new, it's an old attitude really. Uh, it's the attitude that he understood uh, as a freshman member of the Senate when Mansfield was the majority leader that uh, the Senate was a co-equal branch of government that it had to once in a while stand up to the excesses of the executive branch, push back, that he brings some of that to, to our politics and that 
maybe a small glimmer of hope, but it is a little glimmer of hope. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our hour, and this has been a lively and informative discussion. Uh, Mark, before we let you go, I'd like to invite uh, everyone in the audience uh, who would turn on their camera and give you a virtual round of applause or just put up a hand in uh, Zoom to uh, show your uh, our appreciation for you. And uh, um, it's been a, a great way to uh, take some uh, insights from the past and apply them to current politics. And we're grateful for that. So uh, uh, please don't be a stranger. And I should say that uh, uh, copies of Mark's uh, book can be ordered through Book People uh, downtown. Uh, uh, I know she was hoping to have a couple in stock this week, but uh, if you'd like to read more, uh, I think, uh, and it should be a book the University of Idaho Library owns if it's not uh, uh, already on order. So I uh, hope that uh, they add it to their collection as well. Um, Thank I hope you so much, Tim. Really appreciate I hope that uh, you'll join us next week and our program uh, will be dealing uh, with uh, the uh, popular culture, affect, and animals uh, featuring a, a historian and English literature scholar uh, and uh, modern language specialists. So uh, next Tuesday, uh, the 20th, uh, 12.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, please join us then. <laughs>